It is not easy to silence the heckling and jeering at Queen's Park, but our next guest did just that last week. Saul Mamakua is the NDP MPP for the new riding of Kiwetanug in northwestern Ontario, and he joins us now. Welcome. Great to be here. It's nice to have you here at TVO. Um, So last week during question period in the legislature, you spoke about a young girl, a 13-year-old girl who had killed herself. Um, She was from Bearskin Lake, a remote flying community in your riding. Um, Before we show some of that exchange, I should add that you posed the question to the Premier, but he deferred your question to his health minister, Christine Elliott. Sheldon, can we please roll the clip? What is the Premier prepared to do to ensure these uh, pandemics of our young Indigenous uh, people killing themselves stops once and for all. There's lots of work that we need to do, but um, I look forward to working with you, to visiting your communities and to understanding from people directly what supports that they need, and then we will um, do our best to make sure that we can provide those supports. And at that point, you continued to press the Premier, and he called on Minister uh, Lisa McLeod, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, who expressed her commitment to also working with you on this issue. Um, what was going on through, you, through your mind when you were listening to the ministers? I mean, certainly it's good to hear uh, the words, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, that they care. Uh, however, you know, like, uh, you know, it's a really a human uh, you know, after the, uh, when I was hearing those, it really brought me to, uh, you know, uh, to a discussion where we can have a, a chat on those issues. And uh, certainly right after question period, we were able to have a chat whereby, you know, the, the Premier came over and that uh, it uh, affected him and that there's no party lines, uh, whether it's PC, the NDP. That's a dis- discussion that we had and, you know, and that they were there. And uh, uh, what he told me was to, uh, that he would, uh, you know, he referred to his, both of his ministers, Minister of uh, uh, Indigenous Affairs and also uh, uh, Lisa McLeod, Minister Lisa McLeod. So I, I was able to have a, uh, a conversation with him as well and, and what can we do? But in, during, question, um, during question period though, you posed the question to him. Um, how did you feel about the ministers responding instead of him responding to your question? Um, it, uh, I mean, it, it's a very, uh, uh, very real question. Uh, you know, like that's really, uh, you know, the humanity of it. And uh, it, uh, I mean, it's, he referred it, uh, and I, I, I don't think he understands what the issues are in the communities. And, I, I, and what I thought was, uh, you know, he probably doesn't realize what's happening in the backyard of Ontario. That was my initial reaction when I uh, when I first seen that. So, and to refer to you know the, the minister responsible for those issues. Uh, that's how I felt. How I seen it. And then afterwards, you spoke. Um, for us, you know, we're so removed. We live in Toronto, um, and when we hear of a young child um, taking their own life, um, 13 years old, just a baby, you have to. Um, comfort that family. Uh, You're the person that's representing their voice at Queen's Park. What do you say to a family uh, when a child, their own child, uh, commits suicide, takes their own life? Um, There's no no words that you can say. Um, I had an opportunity to, uh, you know, visit the family, the community, the leadership, and the youth. And I had an opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, hug the mother, and, um, you know, I couldn't help it, uh, you know, like I, all I could say, you know, I'm sorry, and I couldn't help it, but just uh, be, uh, be there for the family. Sometimes it just helps just to be there, mm-hmm. to show, uh, you know, that you, you care, to show that, uh, you know, that you're here to represent them and, you know, that we will uh, address these issues in the coming years, the coming days, uh, you know, the coming months. So. It's a really, uh, it's a really difficult uh, situation when you have to, uh, you know, uh, try to, uh, you know, comfort uh, uh, the families, uh, the leadership, the youth, and uh, on how they're feeling, and uh, and that it's just to, you know, you're basically asking them to, you know, we need you to stay alive. 
And in your full remarks, um, we only showed a little bit of it, but in your full remarks, the young girl, <clears throat> her name was Carlina. Yes. Um, you said that Carlina's suicide was not just a health crisis, but it was also a housing crisis, a mental health crisis, and an intergenerational trauma crisis. Um, how do you confront a crisis that's a result of so many different factors? You know, uh, one of the, re one of the uh, things I've realized over the years, you know, uh, you know, uh, you have to have lived it to understand it, to see it. You have to see it like what's happening in, the, in, the, in those communities, in our communities. It's a really, uh, you know, like when we talk about education, uh, when we talk about child welfare, when we talk about health, when we talk about the justice system, the policing system, we have to understand these are colonial systems. You know, the, like people refer to them as, as if they're broken, broken system, but in fact, uh, they're, you know, uh, they're not broken. They're, they're actually working the way they've been des designed to, which is to take away the rights of our indigenous peoples, take away the rights of First Nations peoples. And you know, these are just tools mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, in place. These are just tools that, uh, you know, to remove those and you know, even the reserve reservation system to take away from our lands. You call them tools, like tools for the federal government. Tools for the federal government, not only that, I mean, uh, the Ontario government as well. You know, uh, we have to understand that uh, Ontario is a signatory to uh, Treaty 9. And, uh, and that's why I believe that it's really important that, you know, uh, <laughs> you say federal government, but, but what happens is um, sometimes when I ask, um, when I ask, uh, you know, the ministers about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the people in our communities uh, on reserve, uh, they, they say, they'll tell me that they have to talk to their federal counterparts, which kind of tells me that's, uh, you know, no, that's their way of saying no, because, you know, that's the federal jurisdiction. And, and when, when they do that, what really it comes down to is it's a really, you know, like um, uh, the systems are built to, uh, you know, they, our people fall into this, um, um, jurisdictional ambiguity and and uh, governments play this uh, jurisdictional ping-pong of uh, our, on our people and within those uh, you know that game of jurisdiction they fall into this jurisdictional black hole and as for this case for Carlina she fell into that jurisdictional thing and it is, it's uh, you know to be complacent to play that game you know it's the cost of children's lives and we have to understand that and uh, we can't do that anymore. We need jurisdictional um, responsibility, not that ambiguity that yeah, governments play. Um, I'm sensing, um, I can hear a lot of emotion in your, in your voice. Um, it must be an interesting position for you to be in because you used to work for a First Nation. Now you're working, so uh, I guess on the other side, the provincial government. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate that position? <clears throat> It's a very, you know, when I first uh, decided uh, to run as an MPP, um, it was a very difficult position, uh, decision I had to make because uh, I've always worked on the First Nations, advocating for the First Nations side. And the way I kind of looked at it is, you know, I'm going into a colonial system, a system that, you know, uh, oppresses people. And, and oppresses you. Uh, oppresses me. Yeah. And so it's really uh, in, but I, over the um, over the uh, the last few months that we've been sitting, and uh, I've started to recognize, you know, some of the how I can navigate to be able to bridge my my people as First Nations Indigenous people into the colonial system that the system that is here in at Queens Park, and to be able to uh, for them to understand the, some of the processes, some of the uh, you know the. Uh, some of the processes, the, the policies, the approaches, and uh, the the, uh, the acts that are in place, most times do not work for our people, and that's why it's really critical to work with us, work with our people, and to, uh, when we set these um, um, you know policies, approaches, or uh, acts in place, and uh, and I believe I uh, you know uh, it's going to be a, a long four years. Uh, just because uh, we're working with a government that, uh, you know, uh, that does not mention reconciliation, uh, that has uh, removed the uh, uh, reconciliation and relations uh, out of the ministry itself. Um, even this, like, 
during this, you mentioned the jurisdiction, the ambiguity of the jurisdictions between the provincial and the federal government. Um, also, this past week, uh, Romeo uh, Saganash <clears throat> in parliament, um, he actually swore, um, he accused the prime minister of not caring about indigenous rights in the context of the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline project consultations. Um, how do you, what can be done to, I guess, fix that divide? or to bridge that divide um, uh, between the governments and the people? Um, I think um, including uh, our people in those discussions, whether it's uh, when you want to talk to education, when we want to talk about child welfare, when we want to talk to uh, uh, about health, anything that relates to uh, uh, provision of services for our people, we have, we have to be in the driver's seat. We have to be uh, the ones making the, at the decision making table. And so it's really critical, like uh, when we start talking about, uh, you know, like uh, accountability, responsibility, you know, resource allocation right into the community. So that's what we need to start transforming, uh, you know, these systems and to whereby, you know, we bring back the power and the authority back to the communities. And then that's, uh, that's going to take some time. And uh, we need to uh, bring back the, uh, you know, decolonize our people and give the and start empowering our people. We only have a few minutes um, left, but I know the health file is something that you've been uh, working before you were in Queens Park. Uh, you worked in First Nations healthcare. What's the medical um, situation like for people living in Northern Ontario within Indigenous communities? When we talk about uh, equity, uh, equality of access to service is not near as well the rest of Ontario, Ontarians have access to. So I think there's a, you know, like a, there is certainly, uh, you know, again, that whole of uh, that jurisdictional whole or that, the inequity that exists, it, it is there. And, you know, like sometimes uh, there's so many things that happen in our communities that needless deaths, the unnecessary suffering, you know, nobody hears about it. And, uh, and, uh, I believe that we need to get away, start, uh, you know, the, the, anywhere else in Ontario. You know, what, what I know, what I know what's happening in our communities, it would not be accepted. In, like what? In down Toronto, like, you know, like, uh, example is, uh, you know, like, um, you know, uh, an elderly man shows up in a nursing station in our community and his limbs are ready to fall off. And the next day he gets sent out to, uh, you know, Thunder Bay and then his legs are amputated. And you know, somewhere the system, the healthcare system, really missed the boat on on that issue, on that patient, mm -hmm. and that we should have picked it up far way before that. We're looking at. Um, we're going to show a map here, and um, you used to. Can you tell us what the medical significance of Sioux Lookout is? Uh, Sioux Lookout is. Uh, you know, they have a hospital that's. Uh, you know, fairly new. 2011. I mean, 2010. It opened. But before that, there was a uh, there was a, a, an Indian hospital, and a, and a provincial hospital, um, and uh, in 1997 they were uh, they amalgamated those two hospitals. So it took those years when, when we opened the new hospital to come up into a, a system that's uh, more integrated. But we our people were told that you no know, the, the the health system the access to health service would improve, but we're still like we're seeing that it's not. It's not uh, improving, it's actually getting worse. So, and I think uh, it's a very, uh, health is a very complex system in the North. Because people have to be flown in to, into Sioux Lookout to just receive medical care, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, like, uh, cer yeah, certainly, like there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like I, I seen a picture uh, two days ago, uh, you know, there's a facility uh, hostel for patients that come from the North. You know, um, uh, there's a hundred bed facility uh, on a daily basis, there's 250, you know, patients that have to go through there, and we don't. There's an overcrowding of it, so, so that means, uh, you know, like we're flying a lot of uh, our patients down to access these services. And that's about 45,000 people. Well, about that 30, one hub it serves 45,000 people. No, it's about uh, maybe 32,000 people. That but from like 49 different communities. Or? No, that, that's you're talking about. Nishina Basque okay. Nation has a nine to the 49, 50,000 communities, but that, in my writing. The Solicard area is about maybe uh, 
uh, 32,000. But the point being is if I lived in Toronto, if I got sick, I could just go to the local hospital and be looked at. Instead, if you're up there, you have to actually f be flown out yeah. to get help. And in, in my community, uh, it's a community of 600, uh, you'll see uh, uh, we have uh, five days of physician services per month, which is 60 days per year to, uh, for a physician. And, you know, uh, and then there's a shortage of uh, physician services already in the north. And like sometimes, uh, you know, like I was talking to some of my physician friends, you know, uh, like for the, you know, for the last 24 days, I've been working for, for 24 straight days. You know, it just uh, there's a shortage up there, and you know, uh, recruitment of uh, physicians, recruitment of uh, healthcare professionals is uh, it's challenging. It's, it's very challenging. Um, we just have a minute left. Um, what would you say is the number one thing, in your opinion, that needs to change in order for the, those concerns, including youth suicide and First Nations, to be addressed? Um, we need to, uh, you know, one of the key things that's really critical is uh, for children and youth. Um, and uh, when we talk about mental health services, when we talk about developmental service for children and adolescents, I think that's the number one key. Like, we need to keep our youth safe. We need to give access to our children. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like children are the voice of the voiceless of, uh, within the system, right? So we need to have them, uh, you know, give them the access to, of service. I think that's very key right now. Like I know when the uh, Nishinaabasuke Nation declared a public health health emergency, that was a, the number one priority, but there's m lots of others and the, the, there's a lot of, it. it's a complex issue. You know, like the, uh, when I talk about housing, when I talk about, uh, you know, access to services, access, access to health services, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's bigger than that. It's and, not one thing, it's many things. Yeah, it's uh, when we talk about social determinants of health, we have to address those and you know, uh, governments just don't have the will to be able to to make change. We need the will, you know. Well, thank uh, you so much for yeah. your time. We appreciate you coming to TVO and sharing your knowledge with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, for more on our in-depth conversation with Salt Mamakwa, head to TVO.org and check out his Q&A with our Northwest Ontario Hub editor, John Thompson. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.